Welcome back to Physics 272. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel about physics. So I hope you feel the same way about physics. All right, last time we talked about um, spheres. We talked about what happens if we have a hollow sphere of charge and what's the electric field coming off of the hollow sphere of charge. And we talked about the solid sphere of charge and what's the electric field due to a solid sphere of charge. The hollow sphere just means that there are charges distributed on the shell of the sphere, but not in the inside. And it turned out that inside, the electric field cancels. Okay? There is electric field being exerted in there, but it sums up to net zero. And then outside, it looks like a point particle. A similar situation for the solid sphere. Outside, it looks like a point particle. Inside, we imagined ourselves inside of the solid sphere, and we thought of the solid sphere as broken up into shells, right? since we already knew the shell equation. So basically what happens is that if I'm inside of a shell, no electric field contributes. So if I'm sitting right here halfway inside the sphere, anything that's an outer shell contributes nothing, but I have to sum up the contributions from the inner shells. So summing up the contributions from the inner shells, we got this formula for the inside that the electric field goes up as I move out of the sphere, right? So as I, as I move farther and farther away from the center of the sphere, more and more shells are contributing to the electric field. Okay. Do you have any questions from last time? Yeah. Can you go over which R variables are Oh, thank you. Little r is your distance from the center, and big R is the radius. Thank you. So little r being the distance from the center, that encodes the fact that as I step away from the center, more and more shells are inside, and more and more shells are contributing. So it does need to increase as I step away from the center. Until I get to the very edge, in which case, then it starts looking up like a point particle, and then it decreases like a point particle. Good question. Other, other questions? OK? All right. So today, we're going to have first a review of potential energy and uh, talk about electric potential and the potential uh, due to two charges, and as well as uh, multiple charges. So let me first review for you what, um, what single particle energy was. Now, uh, we're assuming that you took our previous course, Physics 172, which was all about mechanics. Or, you know, if you tested out of it, then, then um, maybe you might not be quite so familiar with exactly how we think about things in the matter and interactions course. So the energy of a single particle we define as follows. I'm just reminding you of stuff you already know. We define it as mc squared divided by this funny looking thing which is uh, the Lorentz factor. It's the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. c is the speed of light, v is the velocity of your particle. What it means is that there's some sort of contribution due just to existence, just to a particle existing. It's got a mass. That mass has intrinsic in it some sort of rest energy, we call it. And then any kinetic energy on top of that, we just label as k. But here's the explicit formula. Now, you probably. Um, also have seen kinetic energy described as 1 half mv squared. Turns out that's an approximation, but it's a very good approximation if your particle is moving at speeds that are slow compared to the speed of light. And the speed of light's pretty fast, so this covers most situations. So we can make an approximation then if the speed of the particle is much, much less than the speed of light, say 0.1% or less, and we, we pull out the rest energy, mc squared, plus 1 half mv squared. Right? But going back to the principle itself, it's that the single particle energy is its rest mass plus its kinetic energy. The energy principle for a particle, remember uh, physics 172 was based on two big ideas. We had the energy principle, which is that energy is conserved. And we had the momentum principle, which is that momentum is, is conserved. And so the energy principle was the following, that I can change the energy of a particle by doing work on it. So if I put work in, the energy of that particle increases. Okay? And the work is defined as integral f dot dr. So that's the work on that particle. Now, assume the rest energy doesn't change. So assume that uh, the mass of the particle isn't going to change during this process, which is a safe assumption. And then the change in the particle energy is uh, just due to kinetic energy. right? If this guy can't change, then it's all kinetic energy changing. And so when I do work on a particle, I can speed it up. It's as simple as that. right? So if I put work in a particle, then I can change its kinetic energy. Do you have any questions so far? Should be totally familiar from, from your previous physics course here. To help you remember how to calculate work, 
Let's say that I have this bead on a wire. The wire's got a complicated shape, okay? And the wire is long. It's 25 meters. At the end of the day, though, this particle, when I push it to the end of the wire, will have traveled 10 meters across and one meter up, okay? In the process to get that bead over there, the only force I had to apply was a constant force of 10 newtons to push it along, okay? So let's say under those conditions, now you tell me how much work was done moving the bead. Okay, all right, so this is to help you remember how to calculate work. Work is integral force dot dr. So tell me a line of reasoning that we need to consider here. What are you thinking? Yes. Okay, all right, so I'll repeat this for those in the back. So the problem says the force that's moving the particle is a horizontal force of 10 newtons. So that means it's only, you know, it's only in this direction. Horizontal is along the x-axis. So then I just need, from f dot dr, I need to find what's the component of the motion that's parallel to that force, right? So you're pointing out that perpendicular displacements don't matter in f dot dr. So the force here along the x-axis just is going to um, pick up that contribution along the x-axis. Is that, that was much wordier. He said it so much better. I should have just handed him the mic. Anyway, so got it, right? So it's a horizontal force. F dot dr says I just pick up the length contribution that's parallel to that force. And the length contribution parallel to that force is this delta x. Now, is, are there other things we need to consider here? OK. OK, all right. So he's pointing out that another simplification of the problem is to just take the force dotted into the total displacement. So in this case, the force applied is constant. So when I think of work as integral f dot dr, the force in this case is constant, so I can just pull it through the integral. Constant force times integral dr is just the displacement, but it's the part that's parallel to the force applied, which is just this guy. So another, another way to think about it. Good. Any other, any other thoughts or about this one? Okay, all right, so that was just to remind you how to calculate a uh, work, and it's 100 joules because we have 10 newtons times 10 meters. Okay, now that, remember how, now that we remember how to calculate work, I'm going to go on from the single particle case and calculate multiple particle situations. What I want to do is remind you how we defined potential energy, okay, and then we want to uh, define potential energy in terms of electrical systems. So to, to define uh, potential energy, we actually need to get more than one particle in the system, right? A single particle with nothing else in the universe, there's nothing uh, like potential energy associated with that. Potential energy is an interaction energy between two or more objects. So I need to, put, uh, I need to find out what's the uh, energy principle for multiple particles. So let's build it up for two particles. So I have particle one and particle two, ever so cleverly named in physics, particle one and particle two. Let me say that one and two are the system. I always get to define the system. Okay, I draw an imaginary box around particles, and whatever's inside is the system, whatever's outside is the surroundings. So this particle one might experience a force due to its surroundings, and it, might, and it will experience a force due to particle two as well if they're interacting. Same thing for particle two. It's got some force on it due to the surroundings. We don't know what it is. And it's got a force on it due to particle one. So I want to take all those forces into account and derive the energy principle for this two particle system. So I'll start with the energy principle for each particle individually. And then I'll just add that together. And that gives me the multi-particle energy principle. So the change in energy on particle one is all the work done on particle one. All the work done on particle one includes all the forces on it during the motion. So that includes any force due to the surroundings and any force due to particle two. So I wrote those both down. I'm going to keep track of them separately, though. So the total force is force on one due to the surroundings plus force on one due to particle two. I keep track of them separately because I want to separate out surroundings and internal, um, internal effects. So the first term is the work done by the surroundings. The second term we're going to call W12, it's the work done on particle one by particle two during some sort of change that happens. Okay? Is that clear so far? All right. So now I'm going to write down the exact same thing for particle two. This is the energy principle for particle two, which is that changes in energy on particle two are due to work done on particle two. Part of the work is done by the surroundings, that's this term, integral F 
uh, two comma surroundings.dr plus this part is the work done on particle two by particle one during the motion. And then I have work done by surroundings plus work done on particle two by particle one. Do you have any questions so far? Okay, so it's the same old energy principle. I put work into something and I change its energy. In this case, I'm just separating out when particle one experiences a change, is this going to be work done by the surroundings or work done by something internal to the system? Now I'm going to add it all together and get the total energy principle. So the total change in energy of the two particle system is the total amount of work done by the surroundings, I just add these two terms, plus the total work done internally, okay? So, so far so good? All right, now tell me this though, look back up here at particle one and particle two, they're exerting forces on each other and they're equal and opposite, right? Do I get to scratch off internal work because I have equal and opposite forces? Hmm, okay, I heard a yeah and then I heard a hmm. Okay, so let's think about this. I have equal and opposite forces, but is this guy gonna cancel? That's the question. So is it possible for internal work to actually have a net contribution or does it always cancel? Yeah. Okay. Okay, all right. So I'll just repeat this for people in front who couldn't hear. The forces are equal and opposite for these internal pairs, right? But the displacements could be totally different. So I could have a situation where only one particle moves, all right? Or maybe both particles move. So, you know, maybe a good way to think about this is pretend these guys are charges, okay? And with a the spring there, I'm going to stand back just in case the spring snaps. It will hurt me and not you. Um, so these guys are attracting each other due to the spring. So it's like they're um, oppositely charged particles. And maybe I have a motion like you're saying. There's this equal and opposite force, but maybe only one particle moved. So the displacements are not going to cancel, right? We don't, we don't know a priori what the displacements are. So we actually have to keep this term around. Here's an example, though. I'll give you an example of where the forces would cancel. So there's a force pulling these guys together, internal force. If they go through the exact same displacement, then it canceled, right? So this work internal happens if there's a change in structure of the internal system. So if I do something like this, then there was internal work. If I do something you know, to squish it, then there was internal work. So if the system changes shape, then there's some sort of internal work happening. Do you have any questions about that so far? Okay, all right, so we do need to keep around this internal work um, because it, it certainly can happen during motion. Okay, so there's the equation we had for the total energy change of the two particle system. Change in total energy is work done by the surroundings plus internal work that happened. And I'm reminding you of what the single particle energy principle looked like. For the single particle case, we had this nice neat equation and it said change in particle energy is uh, the work done on it. Okay, and in this case, since it was a single particle, it was the work done by the surroundings. I'd like to make this look a little bit more like the single particle case. So I'd like to separate out the work done by the surroundings. Because I want to consider now particle one and particle two to be some system as a whole. And I just want to consider the work done by the surroundings. So I'm going to separate that contribution out. Yeah? Are we canceling out work internal? I'm sorry, where? Are we not canceling out the internal work done in the system? No, we're, we're not going to cancel it out because it's non-zero in general. We're going to keep it around. What I want to do is I want to separate off this term. So I have that the total energy change of the two particle system is equal to work done by the surroundings plus internal work. I'm just going to separate off work done by the surroundings to put it, uh, to make it look a little more like the single particle case. Does that address your question? Ah, okay. Okay, so, um, so the internal, so the question is the forces are equal and opposite why didn't this internal work go away, <laughs> right? So um, the, it goes back to, it goes back to, we lost the pointer, it goes back to right here, the integrals, okay? So the path of each particle is different. The forces are equal and opposite, but the path of each particle is in, is in general different. So um, 
So for example, let me consider uh, you know, the, the internal work done between the marker and the earth during this process, right? So I drop that guy. We're, we'll neglect any motion the earth had, right? And this guy, this guy's the thing that changed its, its distance. So the only contribution then would be the integral um, f dot dr according to this guy's motion. So because the motions can be asymmetric, right? We always, we always when I think in terms of symmetry, the forces are symmetric, but the motions in general are not. So since the motions are not symmetric in general, there's typically internal work. And you can tell if there's internal work or not because if the system changes shape, there's internal work happening. Okay. Good. All right. So we'll keep that term. We'll keep the internal work term. And what I want to do next then is solve for the work done by the surroundings. I want to think of the two particles as a single object, the system, and just think about what's happening from the outside. And I want to think about work being done by surroundings now affecting the system itself. So, so I'm going to make a definition here. I'm going to define work done by the surroundings is change in kinetic energy of the system plus something that we are going to define as potential energy. Okay, this is, this is the equation where we define potential energy. So look at these two equations. Here's what we derived before. Here's my new definition of what happens if I solve for the, the work done by the surroundings. And I'm going to call this term here change in potential energy. Can you tell me, just by comparing those two equations, can you tell me how change in potential energy is related to internal work? How is delta U related to work internal? Yeah. Yeah, it's the negative. So in fact, this is just a definition. I compare these two equations, and I say, look, this part's the same, this part's the same. It must be that delta U is minus work internal. So this internal work that can happen when a system changes shape, the particles in the system do work on each other, okay, and that changes the energy of the system, and we're going to call that a change in internal energy of the system. So for example, in the case of these two guys, if they change shape like this, all right, now they've got um, higher potential energy. Okay? And here's, here's one way you know they've got high potential energy. When I let it go, it tends to do something. Okay? So if I stretch it and I let it go, it tends to do something. That's a high potential energy state. And the system, when you let it go, tends to want to lower its potential energy. So potential energy, the important thing here is that potential energy is an interaction energy. A single particle has no potential energy because it's not interacting with anything. But two particles interacting together, they have an interaction energy, and that interaction energy is potential energy. Okay? Do you have questions about that? Okay? All right. So to get a feel then, to get a, a better feel for how this goes, we'd like to think of the potential energy of two charges. I'll use these guys as an analogy. Um, and potential energy comes from the interaction of two objects or more objects. We can find what the potential energy was by just looking at how the interaction changes during a change in size of the system. So let me, for example, take Q1 and Q2. I'm going to hold Q1 fixed, and now I'm going to move Q2, and I'm going to see what happens uh, to the system. So the question I'll ask is, how much work do I have to do? All right. So. In, in moving Q1 and Q2 apart, Q1 and Q2 have a particular force between them. So let me uh, draw a vector here which represents the force on charge 2 due to charge 1. That's this direction. Okay, that's our typical force equation, force law. It's the Coulomb law. And I want to think about, well, what happens if I reach in there and do something? So it's like these two particles are a particular distance apart. I want to reach in and move Q2. right? So the surroundings are going to be represented here by this hand. We're going to reach in and do something to change the size of the system. And in doing that, I want to, I want to move Q2 from position A to position B. I'm going to do work on the system. Okay? In the process, I'm going to change the potential energy of the system. So I'm going to calculate here the work that I have to do against Q1's influence. So this is the work done by the surroundings is integral from A to B of the force we're applying here dotted dx. Right? And so the force we're applying here uh, is opposite to this force. Right? This force here is the Coulomb force between these guys. So particle 1 is exerting a force in that direction. I'm going to 
oppose it in order to move things. So that's the origin of this minus sign here. So that's integral from a to b, q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared times r hat dot dr. All right, and then these guys um, are parallel. Uh, so when I take the integral here, integral 1 over r squared gives me another minus sign. So that becomes q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught 1 over r. Plug in the a and the b and the 1 over r. And you get all together q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught times 1 over b minus 1 over a. So that's the work that I have to do as the surroundings in order to move particle 2 from position a to position b. Question? Can you explain the minus sign again? OK. So there's a few minus signs. That's, <laughs> that's what made this a little bit confusing. So this force here right, is, um, is think of it as pointing back this way, right? the original. Let's, let's do this. This, is, this green vector represents the force on Q2. So if I've drawn it that way, I'm thinking of something attractive, right? So I'm thinking of these guys being attractive. Now I'm going to do work. I'm it, the surroundings, and I'm going to push the particle, OK? So now I've got something opposite. So because the work I'm doing is in the opposite direction, that's the origin of this minus sign here. It's the first minus sign. The second minus sign comes from taking the integral. And then at the end of the day, you want to go back and make sure it's all reasonable. <laughs> so uh, you, should, you should always do both, right? Always carefully track your minus signs exactly like you're asking, and then go back to the physical situation and make sure it makes sense. So in this case, if I had these two particles interacting, and I'm going to reach in with my hand and push one away, I'm adding work to the system. So I should be increasing potential energy. So I'd go back and check that. But really, it depends on the Q1 and the Q2, right? So are these negative or are these positive, right? So it gets a little bit hard, I think, to really intuitively check it until I put some numbers in, right? Yeah, good questions so far, though. So basically, when you put the numbers in, it should all make sense, right? That if I had to push on it, I put work into the system. So I must have, in the process of doing work on the system, right, if I add work to a system, I must raise its energy. So I must have raised the potential energy. Yep. Yep. Good questions. Other questions so far? OK. All right. I find keeping track of the minus signs tedious. We have to do it, though, right? We, we go through it. We make sure we do it. And then at the end of the day, you go back and just think physically to make sure it's all in the right direction. OK. So where did the energy go? We did work on the system. And I'm going to set things up such that the velocities are 0 at the beginning and at the end. I don't know what the velocities are in the middle. Part of the beauty of physics is that I don't have to know everything, right? I don't know what the velocities are in the middle, OK? But I'm going to do this motion. And uh, in the initial configuration, there's no velocity. And in the final configuration, there's no velocity. Therefore, the change in kinetic energy is 0 from final to initial. Okay, It was complicated in the middle, but we just check in the beginning and in the end. So work always changes the system energy. So if I did work on the system, it must have gone into something. In this case, it goes into potential energy. So the potential energy must have changed. The work done by the surroundings is uh, defined as change in potential energy in this case. Okay. So we'll define that then as, um, if we can call it a change in potential energy, then another way to look at this is if there's a particular potential energy at each stage of the process. And then I can say that, well, when the system was this far apart at B, there was a particular potential energy. And when it's this far apart, there's a particular other potential energy. I'll subtract those two numbers to get the difference, the change in potential energy. Okay? So if I look at these equations and compare, then the most reasonable breakdown here is to say that the potential energy at position B is this piece of the equation. And the potential energy at the distance A is this piece of the equation. Okay, do you have any questions about that? So we'll write down then a general formula for the potential energy, which is Q1 times Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught times R. R is the distance between those two charges. Okay, so that gives me the total potential energy of that two particle system at any time. Do you have questions about that so far? OK. All right. 
I have a question for you to make sure you're understanding so far. All right, two particles with charge Q sit a distance D apart. So two particles sit a distance D apart. It's actually Q1 and Q2. What's the potential energy of the system, including both particles? Here's the equation we just wrote down. What we want to do is make sure we know how to use it correctly. So I want the potential energy of the entire system, of the entire two-particle system. So what's a, what's a line of reasoning we should take into account here? Yes, please. OK, so you uh, started way back and started with, uh, you took an integral of the force to get the potential energy. Is that right? OK, all right. All right, and which did that lead you to a particular answer here? OK, led you to B. OK. All right, I like that, going back to first principles and deriving it from scratch, MacGyver style. Do you guys even know what MacGyver is? Yes, OK, yes, no. OK, go watch some on YouTube. OK. The other way to think about this is that we derived this equation for the potential energy. So here's the equation for the potential energy. And potential energy is always interaction energy. It's always a pairwise interaction. So this term here, Q1, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r, that's the potential energy of the two-particle system. So I don't have to add it twice. It just is the interaction energy. And another way you can think about this is I, I like to think about this in terms of diagrams. So I have Q1 and Q2. I draw this line between them. And I can think of that line as representing the interaction between them. So another way to think of it is I've got two particles, yeah, but there's only one line connecting them. There's only one interaction between them. OK, and that's this interaction energy here, Q1, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r. Questions about that? OK, all right. So to think a little bit more um, deeply about what this interaction energy means. Yeah, you have a question. I'm sorry, I did not understand why it's B. Why it's B? It, you know, it has, you mean as opposed to A? Yeah. Yeah, so the reason it's B as opposed to A is it has to do with the fact that this interaction, this potential energy, is an interaction energy. It's the energy between the two. So there's only, um, how do we say this? It's that this potential energy here already took into account the work done on particle two by particle one plus the work done the other way. Okay. So this thing encodes both of those work contributions. Because as the system changes shape, as the system changes shape, right, then internal work is happening, right? And so we summed up the whole contribution of the internal work in order to get that equation. So it's already got the contribution from both particles in it. That's the, that's the main point of this clicker question, is do I need to add a factor of two or not? And the answer is that we don't, because to get the equation, we already summed up both contributions. OK? Question here. The next slide is going to help us think about minus signs, OK? So let's think in terms of, he, of this one, all right? And then that'll, that'll make the signs clear, I think. Because the signs depend on which charges you have, right? Is it positive charge? Do I have two positive charges, two negative charges, or a positive and negative charge? So right here, we'll think in terms, in terms of, of these guys. And um, so here, the total potential energy of the two particles is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, Q1, Q2 over R. Okay, But Q1 and Q2 could have various signs. So if Q1 and Q2 are, are both the same, so if it's either two positive charges or two negative charges, they repel each other, right? So if they, um, if they repel each other, then if I have these two positive charges interacting, then I'd have to push on them to get them to move closer to each other, right? And if I'd have to push on them to get them closer to each other, I must be putting energy into the system. And that should increase the potential energy. Okay? So as I think of then decreasing the distance between those guys, potential energy should go up. That's this graph here. Okay? So this graph is the case when Q1 and Q2 are the same sign, in which case I just need to plot a function that goes like 1 over r. And it gets bigger as the distance gets smaller. This is the case where the two charges repel, and I push on them to get them closer to each other. Does that make intuitive sense? That if I have to push on it to get them closer to each other, I must be driving the internal energy up. 
okay? I can't tell if that's not making any sense or if it's making so much sense you're bored. So, you good? All right. Okay. This one is the other case. This is the case if I have opposite charges. So if the opposite charges attract each other, then it's, it's the opposite situation. There's a minus sign, okay? So in the, in the uh, case where it's two opposite charges, then the plot of this goes down, right? It's, it looks like this, such that the potential energy between them is negative. So this is the situation where if I had two, two charges that are oppositely charged, positive and negative charge, and I move them infinitely apart, and then I let one of them go, they tend to be attracted and run back to each other. So I can think of these potential energy diagrams a little bit like a hill. How does the system tend to move on that hill, right? So if I think of, of that case where it's attraction and I let one go, it's like the system rolls down this potential energy hill and tends to, to bring the particles together. Whereas in the repulsive case, right, if I have two particles of like charge, so two positive charges, and I let them go, ping, they fly apart, right? That's because it's like they're tending to roll down that potential energy hill there. Do you have any questions about that? Okay, all right. It's also very much like gravity. Some of you have already asked me after class, gosh, this is looking a lot like gravity. It's because it looks a lot like gravity, okay? So the two forces are very similar. They just have different uh, constants in front. So here's the equations we've been using for uh, electricity. Here's the equations you're used to from gravity. The force equations look very similar, okay? They're both a one over r squared. In the case of electricity, it's, you've got a q1, q2, times this factor in front to get the units right, divided by r squared. In the case of gravity, we have that the force goes like minus g, just a constant to get the units right, times mass 1 times mass 2 over the distance squared. So it's the same form. And then the potential energies also looked very similar. In the case of gravitational potential energy, it's always attractive. Minus sign here means it's attractive. Here, it could be attractive if the two are attracting each other. Otherwise, it's repulsive. Okay. Do you have any questions about that? All right. If you're wondering where, since we put this as potential energy of gravity, if you're wondering what happened to my MGH, okay, you don't need to know this for the class, but there's this explanation here. You can check the notes later for what happened to my MGH. Turns out MGH, where that's the height uh, above the Earth, is just a Taylor expansion of the distance you move something relative to the surface of the Earth where I consider then that distance, right, all height distances I move from the center of the Earth are very, very small compared to the 6,300 kilometers of the radius of the Earth. Yeah, question here? It is. It's totally Taylor expansion. Yeah. Okay, but you don't need to know this. This is just for your curiosity if you're wondering what happened to my MGH. Okay, so we need to get, um, we need to actually define electric potential before we end class today. So let me tell you what this looks like for three charges. And then we'll move from potential energy to something called electric potential. So if I have three charges in the system, okay, we already know what the interaction energy looks between two charges. And if I have these two charges here, I think of a line connecting them, which represents their interaction energy. And we already defined that interaction energy. Uh, that interaction energy between 1 and 2 is Q1, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught R12. Now I think of all the other pairs in the system, right? There's another pair in the system, which is 2 with 3. And that line represents a term here, q2, q3, over 4 pi epsilon naught, r2, 3. And then I think of this line here connecting 1 and 3. All right? So for however many particles I have, I could always draw the lines connecting them. Each line represents an interaction term, and that goes in here. So can you guess what would happen if I added more particles? More Just add more terms. That's this equation. You already know what it means. Let me tell you what potential means um, if I don't use the word potential energy, but I just say electric potential. Anybody heard of a voltage? Yeah, yeah there you go. Voltage is potential. Here's how you get it from what we've been talking about, okay? So electric potential is basically the potential to have potential energy. We've been talking about potential energy. Let's say that I have this case here where I have a positively charged particle right here. Think of a proton in an electric field. All right. When it's in there, it's got a particular interaction energy with the parallel plates that are here producing the electric field. Okay? All right. So there can be a potential energy there. If I 
Take the particle out of the system, though. I think that, well, there's not any potential energy there anymore if there's no particle there. Once the particle's in, I can now define potential energy again. So I can think then that before I even put the particle in the system, there's the potential to have potential energy. All right? And what I'll think of then is that I'll define that potential energy again as the test charge, the amount of test charge times something called potential. So I'll redefine the electrical energy, the interaction energy, as the test charge times the potential. And then the potential comes back as the interaction energy divided by the test charge. This now is what you know of as voltage. It's in joules per coulomb or the more familiar volts. So there's our electric potential. It's basically the potential to have potential energy should you put a test charge into the system. Okay? All right. That's it. We're done for today. And I'll see you guys on Wednesday.